everyone to the session called Taming Tabloid Tittle Tattle, which is very difficult for me to say. <laughs> uh, my name is Natalie Rothschild. I'm going to be chairing the debate, obviously. I'm a freelance journalist myself and a contributor to Spiked, the uh, online magazine that's sponsoring the media strand here at the Battle of Ideas. I also run something called the Young Journalist Academy, which is a program for sixth form uh, state school pupils who want to pursue a career in uh, journalism. And we, we have a summer school where we always uh, actually include a session on celebrity and showbiz reporting, and we also visit various media organizations, including the News of the World, until that uh, closed down, and this summer we were at the Sun. So in this session we want to look at so-called tabloid culture and whether in the wake of the phone hacking scandal they've been dealt with fairly or unfairly. Do tabloids have a place in the media landscape? Are uh, celebrity stories just sort of uh, salacious, um, voyeuristic trash, or is it something that we journalists actually should and have a responsibility even to, to cover? Are privacy breaches necessary to reveal stories that are in the public interest? And who indeed gets to decide what is in the public interest? So those are some of the questions that might come up uh, during the course of this uh, discussion. Our first speaker will be familiar to uh, many of you, I'm sure. He's uh, Roy Greenslade here on the, uh, my far right. He's a professor of journalism at City University, but also writes about the media and media issues for The Guardian website and the London Evening Standard. He's worked on most of Britain's national newspapers, including The Sun, The Sunday Times, and The Daily Mirror. Uh, Mark Borkowski describes uh, himself on Twitter as an upbeat... <laughs> Did I mispronounce your name? It's, it's quite all right. Borkowski. Yes, Borkowski. Borkowski. Yeah. Borkowski. <laughs> You're an upbeat cynic, right? Yeah. <laughs> A stunster, publicist, author, and recovering vinyl junkies. Mark has written book, two books. Uh, called The History of the Publicity Stunt and the Fame Formula. I also read on Wikipedia that you once uh, walked an elephant into a fish and chip shop to promote your pursuit. I don't know if that's true. Third speaker is Joe uh, Phillips, who's an award-winning journalist, a communications expert, and a one-time Lib Dem spin doctor. She was actually Paddy Ashdown's press secretary. She was also a key member in the Celebrity Studded Live 8 campaign. Uh, she's stood for Parliament, has driven rallies in the Middle East, and is a West Ham season ticket holder. That's important. That is important. Our final speaker will be Patrick Hayes, who's a uh, fellow spiked uh, writer and also works for the publishers of the Times Education Supplement and Times Higher Education. He also regularly appears on channels like BBC, Channel 4, and Russia Today, commenting on current affairs. So you might have seen him on uh, television. Without further ado, uh, Roy. I guess I'm, I, I would be called a poacher turned gamekeeper. As a previous uh, assistant editor of The Sun and editor of The Daily Mirror, I was, of course, uh, responsible for purveying uh, what we call tittle-tattle, celebrity stories. Uh, but I ought to say that I um, left the Mirror in 1991, so it's a rather long time ago since I did that. I have come to the conclusion that um, prescriptive journalism, that is the journalism which decides whether or not uh, this is good or this is bad, is completely understandable. If I look back to the great days of the Daily Mirror, uh, and I'm not talking about the period I was there, I'm talking about the period of the 60s, uh, we were looking at a, a paper which was both entertaining and informative and, it has to be said, educative. Um, and that formula uh, was uh, quite brilliantly done uh, for a considerable period of time, which is why the Daily Mirror managed to uh, get its spot circulation up to 5 million and beyond, making it the highest ever selling a daily newspaper in this country. Uh, when the sun came along, uh, it, it really basically stole the mirror's clothes in the, in, from 1969 onwards by deciding that we should not have any kind of educative function. Uh, we should play down the informative stuff and we should merely indulge in entertainment. It still contained uh, information. It still did news-breaking journalism, and it continues to do so. I don't take that away from it. But those of us who now believe 
uh, that perhaps it is time to regulate that press more severely, are accused, I've just read uh, Mick Hume's really extremely good challenging book on this subject, we are really basically accused of being elitist. That is, that we are prescribing for the working class, for the masses, if you like, for those people who read the tabloids, what they should read by deciding that we should in some form regulate it. But I think there are two forms of elitism. There is that kind of cultural editorial elitism, which, by the way, you can never do away with because that's exactly why editors exist, to decide what goes in the newspaper. It's why journalists exist. Journalists tell you what the news is. But the, the other form of elitism, of course, comes straight from A.J. Liebling's famous quote that the freedom of, express, of the press exists only for those who own one. In other words... Uh, Rupert Murdoch is an elitist because uh, no one can bust in to the uh, hallowed circle of the small number of owners that exist in this country and that they decide anyway what is news and they're already elitist in that sense because they are the elite. They control. They decide what you read and most importantly decide what you don't read. And for Rupert Murdoch and the other tabloids, and we are really talking here about the tabloids since we're talking about tittle-tattle, what they have done is decided that the majority of their content should be celebrity tittle-tattle, if you like, froth. Now, I understand that we all indulge in froth. Even I have glanced occasionally at the odd kiss and tell about a footballer I might like. But it has to be done with a sense of proportion. Now, everyone here, I'm sure, there'll be no one in this audience, no one on this panel, who would say that they don't believe in press freedom, that we uh, all believe in press freedom, we all believe in freedom of thought, freedom of action, freedom of expression, freedom of will. That is taken as granted. So why should we, people on uh, who argue as I do, why should we in any way wish to inhibit the press? Why do we want, in other words, to regulate? Well, first of all, we've been regulating for an awful long time. We started uh, basically in 1953 when we created the Press Council that we would in some way say, look, the press has gone wrong for all sorts of reasons. It's doing things which are outrageous. It's not so much about content. It's more about methodology and dodgy methods and we need to control it. After, from 53, it ran until 91. In the 1980s, it was decided that we were living in a wild west world. The sun was tramping all over people's rights, intruding, getting into hospitals, intruding into people's private life, publishing stories which were plainly false, and therefore we created the Press Complaints Commission in 91, which has a code of conduct, a code of practice, if you like, of which I was one of the authors. We get to another crisis, which is the hacking crisis, and we re-examine through the Leveson inquiry all over again whether or not our methodology has got out of kilter with what people would regard as being reasonable. So uh, we are weeks away from Lord Justice Leveson, we've got the yellow card, uh, Lord Justice Leveson <laughs> deciding whether or not that regulation now, because self-regulation, where we regulated ourselves, was seen to be false or unhelpful or not or weak uh, and so on, that in the public perception it didn't work. And so what we need to do now is have, and I love this phrase uh, a few grants, a dab of statutory control, a dab of statute. Um, I, I, what we really need is basically to re-establish that form of self-regulation, but perhaps what we really need also to give the public a sense of confidence that it's not an industry tool, that it's not controlled by the Daily Mail, not controlled by The Sun, not controlled by Rupert Murdoch, therefore not controlled by Paul Dacre, that what it really needs is to have some kind of statute behind it to give the public a sense of uh, it being a stronger organisation. I, I could do this for an hour. Two hours. I could be like Fidel and keep you there for four hours. <laughs> but I already feel I've won the argument, so I'll be off back to Brighton. All right, thank you so much.
we've won, actually. I, I'm, a, I'm a publicist, and um, I've been doing this um, since I was 19, and I think a large part of my career was involved with the publicity process of projecting and making celebrity icons. And the canvas of painting that picture at the time uh, was obviously tabloid newspapers. Um, I think the, uh, a lot of the hypocrisy um, that has been spouted from both sides, be it celebrities and journalists, over the Levson process. Um, I came from an age where editors such as Kelv McKenzie, celebrity minders like Rob Gilchrist and the Daily Mail, used to have uh, one adage when they used to phone me up, in which they said, your client is guilty until proven innocent. Um, and I'm, I was fascinated by this whole process of defending my client's image, because ultimately you were using newspapers to project to get that story across. So the idea that tabloid culture has been in existence for the last 20, 30 years is a complete and utter fallacy. Um, when I wrote the first book, um, The Fame Formula, I spent a, long, a lot of time in America um, to see where that industrial process began. And uh, frankly, it started in 1919. So the idea of celebrity and tabloid tittle-tattle uh, began in the big fan magazines stretching back to 1909. So the public hunger for celebrity tittle-tattle you know, has a history. It, it didn't sort of begin with Rupert Murdoch taking over uh, the sun back in the 1970s. Um, it began by there. It changed post-war, um, but I think stati uh, statistically uh, there was in a region of 100 titles uh, in 1924 peddling faction. Um, delivered up by uh, publicists, delivered up by publicity men, who were in fact all ex-journalists. Um, there's always been a tradition for journalists to turn into publicists, and these are the people who drove many of those icons. The idea now that we have that there is this huge explosion um, of truth behind celebrities who have uh, run to the press... Um, starts with the sort of how was it broadcast? How was you know what were the what were the machinery for broadcasting that fame? And that that became back that came back to what the audience wanted. So arguably in 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 this session we're supposedly talking about exactly what the audience wants. Did the tabloids just fulfil what the audience wants? There was a sort of messianic sort of belief by many of the publicists to take control, and there was back as I said then in those days a definitive um, battleground laid between professional publicists and journalists in terms of the truth, of the story. Um, that broke apart. And uh, as soon as Tina Brown and some of the, uh, the icons of control um, took, took control, <coughs> things changed. Things changed radically because newspapers couldn't get at the story. So it turned themselves into this aggressive beast who didn't like the control process being taken out of their hands. They didn't care about the story, they cared about what they brought in terms of selling newspapers. And that's where it all lies, the, the growth of tabloids, um, with the growth of the huge numbers, Roy will correct me, at its, at its, uh, at its prime, the Sun was doing how many numbers? What was 4.2. 4.2 million. Everybody looked around at that. And with a decreasing audience where there became a greater appetite for that tittle-tattle, um, I think the broadsheets <coughs> began to lose confidence. Lack of investment into good journalism realised that what Max Hastings, uh, yeah, Max Hastings decries as Hurley's, that he was fighting Hurleyization. Publicists in the 90s really had the, had the collateral to generate a readership and those sort of those celebrities were controlled by publicists so where we step into is where the ground was re, uh, regained and by doing that we got into some very nefarious tactics the the anthropologists um, of the time back in 1957 uh, Edgar Morin described that the celebrity worship had become a new religion comparable to Christianity I concur with that and it went on back into the into into 2000, where Sheffield Hallam University um, found that they found the lower a person's religious conviction, the more likely was to revere uh, a, a particular celebrity. Everybody fell into that, creating the celebrity agenda, and I think it's 
slightly um, you know, worth talking about how far political parties use the power of celebrities to drive ideas. Charities used celebrities to generate traction, to generate revenue. And it came to that point where the trial of uh, Charles Taylor, uh, the great African um, um, sort of despot, we, 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 the media circled around a year ago the, the moment when Naomi Campbell was there. We have become addicted to the story and to sit back and claim foul is gone beyond it now. Um, and everybody has lost the ability and stopped investing in realism and real stories and find it much easier to talk about celebrity, which then propels us into the age of how news is more ent entertainment rather than f faction. fiction. I want to start by just reading a quote, which is from a commentator condemning, and this is a quote, the almost unbelievable indecency of the intrusion of the tabloid newspaper into pe people's private lives. Surely only the most degraded, low-minded people could produce this kind of news. Now, you could have picked that from last week, today. Actually, it came from 1936, um, from a magazine, apparently, I don't remember it, uh, called Fortnightly. This was a debate um, about intrusion into private groups by newspapers, um, the, the, the early tabloids, which have been referred to, but we'll give us going back a little bit further. Um, it actually reached the floor of the House of Commons, and major news agencies were encouraged to punish reporters who violated standards of decency in pursuit of a story. So obviously that had a huge effect, not. Um, so I don't think there's anything new in the... Uh, the sort of the horror and condemnation of the tabloid press or the press in general. I do think there is the most stinking hypocrisy around criticism of the tabloid press. Uh, Roy referred just a little while ago to, you know, the mission, if you like, of um, the mirror, which was to entertain, educate and inform, which is a sort of slight take on the BBC mission, which was inform, educate and entertain only as a byproduct. So you could argue maybe that the tabloid's mission is to entertain, entertain, titillate and sell. And increasingly, um, that selling has become cross-selling, as Mark knows very, very well, you know, with links to TV programmes or celebrities, whether it's The X Factor or Strictly Come Dancing or Downton Abbey or whatever it happens to be or a particular footballer's autobiography and so on and so forth. So, you know, the idea that this is just journalists going out, intruding into people's private lives um, is, I think, not strictly speaking true because it is a whole industry out there which is to, to get all of this stuff onto the front pages and into the papers. Now, it's terribly easy for most of us to say, and I think we touched on it this morning in the earlier session, it would be much better if we were covering and were exposed to and interested in the 95% of stories around the world that get no coverage at all unless you look very hard for them on online or blogs and what have you. You know, you could argue that we should have eight pages on Syria instead of eight pages on Simon Cowell. Um, but, frankly, who would read it? Um, and I find the, um, this sort of slightly snooty attitude that comes from particularly the Guardian end of the market that actually... It's all about taste and decency, and it's got nothing at all to do with privacy. It's about what we should be reading and what the great British public should be reading. It's nothing short of snobbery. When I did Live Ace, and I was a, a part of the media campaign, as Natalie um, said in the introduction, you know, that basically, for those of you who remember back in 2005, was a campaign to make poverty history. And the whole Live Ace thing focused around the G8 summit in Glen Eagles that year, where the political pressure was on the leaders of the G8 to make a commitment to cutting world poverty and getting rid of um, debt and so on and so forth. You know, this was a great cohort, a great coalition of charities around the world. I've never come across a bunch of more territorial, money-grabbing, attention-seeking people in my life, and I've worked in Westminster. Um, <laughs> don't ever let me you know, get onto charities, because that's another debate. The view that they took 
was we've got to explain this because the public have to understand what this is about. The public actually were more interested, and quite rightly so, in whether Roger Waters and David Gilmore were going to speak to each other before they went on stage, whether the Spice Girls might be persuaded to come on stage at Hyde Park, and you know what other celebrity gossip was going on. That's what the tabloids were interested in. Without the tabloids being interested in the story, Live Aid would not have been the huge success that it was. And yes, it was an absolutely fantastic, blow your head off, brilliant concert with a political message. But it was the concert, the entertainment, the bringing together of all those people that created the energy. Not the worthy, however right-minded or good it might have been. You know, the, the view of Oxfam and Save the Children and all the rest of it, actually, who cares? It was much better and much more effective, in my view, and to get a really, you know, bloody good day out and fantastic uh, musical event going. And in between the songs and in between everything else, and in every interview that Bob Geldof did at the time, you got the message coming across. And you got the message in a way that people could understand. So people went to those concerts, they had a great time or not. They didn't see Pink Floyd beating each other up on stage. But they did go home with a greater understanding, I believe, of what poverty was about and what the big issue was. And the battles that we had with the charities involved were unbelievable because they thought we were, you know, we were going down market. What bothers me, and I will finish now, is that if it is so much about taste, when we see people prosecuted for bad taste tweets or bad taste T-shirts, as has happened recently, it's a very stiff slippery slope towards um, closing down the press for bad taste. And I would just finish on this point that, you know, is there such a thing of privacy at a time when Facebook and Twitter and even the use of mobile phones means that most people parade their entire lives in front of complete strangers without a second thought? It's got, you know, it takes two to tango, and I think uh, criticism of tabloids is hypo hypocritical. I'd like to actually just start by, with a prop, uh, which is the last edition of the News of the World. And actually, one of the really striking things uh, in here is that, you know, they, they kind of go through their 168-year history and show a lot of um, front, page, uh, front pages of previous editions. And you get, for example, at the start, the sinking of the Titanic, you get the two world wars, the death of Queen Victoria, Queen Elizabeth's ascension to the throne. And you see over the you know, last 20, 30 years, there being a real shift. So you get, um, you, you get front cover stories on Ryan Giggs' affair with his brother's wife, Liz Hurley's cheating, um, Je Geoffrey Archer's sex scandals, etc., etc. Uh, and it's very interesting. Just, just in, in this final edition of the News of the World, you do see a rise of, um, you know, certainly an obsession with the, uh, this paper's particular obsession with, with um, tittle-tattle and celebrity culture. And I think there is a broader uh, rise, which I don't think should be celebrated. I, uh, you know, I don't think it's elitist to say that, um, you know, an obsession with people's private lives, an obsession with celebrities is actually quite a, a negative trend. I don't think it should be celebrated. I think it reflects a decline of serious public life and a diminishing of public debate and also reflects the rise of a broader culture of voyeurism and exhibitionism. But fundamentally, I would argue, this isn't something that's driven by the media, which is something that you hear endlessly. The media is always kind of... Uh, it's very easy to single out the media, to point the finger at it and say it's the tabloids that are to blame, the toxic tabloids that are responsible for brainwashing the masses, causing massive cultural dumbing down, encouraging the objectification of women with page three, etc., etc., Hugh Grant, the, the cheerleader for Leveson, um, uh, says um, uh, that Britain's tabloids have nurtured a culture of pure evil. You hear this kind of thing a lot, you know, the tabloids are nurturing this culture. It's the tabloids that are uh, causing it. Steve Coogan, another Leveson che cheerleader, um, um, says that some tabloid jour uh, journalists are sociopaths who are infecting the UK uh, with an amoral universe of theirs engaging in tawdry muckraking. So uh, again and again, you hear people pointing the finger at the tabloids and saying it's their fault for generating uh, this culture. And I think it's too easy to place the blame purely on the tabloids for this. I say firstly, because as has been pointed out already, these papers are very responsive to what their readers want. 
And I think, you know, in an era of online journalism, when you can get very good data about what people want, what people are reading on, uh, online, um, actually journalists have become very, very receptive, uh, more than ever before, to, to, to what people are interested in, what people are, are reading. So uh, in one way, you could argue they're not driving this culture as much as just responding to a demand for it. Now, I would personally prefer a culture, uh, a culture where people just meet, say, uh, news about Max Mosley's S&M fetishes and sex games with a shrug, say, who cares, it's his private life, uh, it's none of my business. And I do think it's sad when celebrity affairs have more prominence and papers devote more resources and intellectual energy to debating whether, for example, Kristen Stewart will get back together with our pats than getting to grips with a very complex situation in Syria. You know, this isn't some, I don't want to be a relativist about this. I don't think it's something to be celebrated, that there is this particular culture at the moment. But I do think there is space for both. I think if people want to read gossip, then that's fine. And certainly, you know, since the start of the popular press, there has been a, a, an appetite for gossip and tittle-tattle. But it's more entertainment than anything else. I do think, though, there is a trend. I, I agree it's been around for a long time. I do think there is a trend towards increasing voyeurism in the media. And I think the hacking of Millie Dowler's phones really reflects that trend, where it's just opportunism. It's not real journalism in any real sense. It's trawling through um, people's voicemail messages in the hope that you might be able to find a, find a story. And I think you can make a very sh sharp distinction between that and proper investigative journalism. Now, I am, however, very struck by the double standards in this debate. Joe said that uh, there's stinking hypocrisy, and I, I just want to give a few examples of just how bad this stench is of, of hypocrisy. Uh, because you hear a lot of people who are arguing against the tabloids, who are actually, I think, very much engaged in the same celebrity circus and, and the same culture of, of tittle-tattle as well, just on a slightly higher level. So, for example, you, you have uh, Tom Watson's book. He sat on the Culture, Media and Sports Select Committee and grilled Rupert Murdoch and James Murdoch uh, <coughs> last, last year. He wrote a book called Dial M for Murdoch, which was just full of, uh, you know, uh, gossipy accounts of who lives next door to who, etc., who attended whose weddings. Uh, and, you know, the, the whole book it was, is kind of littered with quite narcissistic tittle-tattle. Um, Another example, which I think is key, especially when you contrast it to phone hacking, is WikiLeaks. Now, the serious broadsheet papers would trawl through uh, leaked WikiLeaks documents for tidbits of gossip. And you had The Guardian, The New York Times, etc., reporting a lot of stories about Gaddafi's lust for his saucy Ukrainian nurse, uh, the fact that uh, you know, an American diplomat called uh, North Korea's Kim, uh, Kim Jong-il, a flabby old chap, the fact that Nicolas Sarkozy once chased a rabbit around his office, you know, all these kind of bits of international gossip, which I don't think is actually that different to the news of the world uncovering personal gossip about Prince Harry or Hugh Grant. And I would actually go as far as to say a Leveson inquiry has been one of the worst examples of these, uh, these kind of double standards. Think, for example, of the serious media, media delighting in the revelation that David Cameron signs off text messages to Rebecca Brooks with lol and doesn't know what it means. Um, Jonathan Friedland in The Guardian described the Cameron text in this way. Just 87 words, the text from Rebecca Brooks to David Cameron is nevertheless as densely revealing, as packed with human drama, uh, uh, as the finest, most compact, um, um, sorry, as packed with human drama as the finest, most compact human drama with added cringe value. So, you know, there's this sense that, you know, you the Guardian, the liberal media are delighting in Leveson. And you had, again, Murdoch-related wedding guest list poured over. They talked about who went to the races with who, etc. And you had the whole celebrity circus at Leveson as well. Uh, I'd, I'm also very concerned about the way in which the, the, the political class co opts celebrities to their own uh, ends. So, you know, they're very critical of the way in which uh, the tabloids will be obsessed with celebrities, but they're very happy to get, for example, Angelina Jolie to be a, 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 a UN ambassador or Jamie Oliver to advise on school dinners. Um, there, there is a very cynical kind of co opting of the celebrity culture to actually influence very serious things in terms of policy. It is really important, I think, to point out uh, uh, another trend here, which is that while politicians and campaigners are very critical of the tabloid press for intruding into people's lives, at the same time, the state is very willing to also say we need more intrusion into family life. We need more intrusion uh, into, into the, uh, the private life of troubled families. We need to monitor people's activities on CCTV, push for uh, powers to track everything we do online. 
And I think there's a real top-down erosion of the private sphere, which is taking place actually from the, uh, the, the, the state, from the government. And that, uh, this erosion is being reflected by the tabloids, who, who then come in and, uh, again, become increasingly intrusive. Now, I think we do need a serious debate about the prolifer proliferation of what's been dubbed tabloid culture, what caused it, and how we might be able to bring about a return to a more serious political life. But I don't think there's any quick fixes to clearing up the tabloids. I don't think any laws or codes, certainly any kind of statutory backstop, will be able to tackle this phenomenon. We need a very serious debate about how we can do that. Uh, and hopefully this will be the start of it. I just want to bring one thing I have to start with, because from this side there's been a level of uh, uh, an accusation of snobbery and that this is a matter of taste rather than ethics uh, in some cases. And perhaps you could respond to that and what you think of this double standard that perhaps broadsheets like the Guardian who have engaged in high level gossip or high culture gossip perhaps have gotten off the hook. Okay. Uh, right well, uh, uh, yeah. I, look, I think there's a big difference in who goes down on the Titanic and who goes down on Ryan Giggs. I mean, <laughs> look, it, <laughs> and, 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 and let's, let's make it quite clear. When you, uh, Patrick raised this point about Max Mosley, which is, yeah, I'm glad you did. Um, it, it seems to me that when you say, look, we should shrug when we hear that Max Mosley has hired five prostitutes to beat his bottom till it's red raw, and that we should simply accept that, we should be in a position to be so grown up, and lots of this, by the way, is the same about footballers' sex lives and other people's sex lives, that we should all be grown up enough to understand that it doesn't matter. It's up to that person. But say you are the Max Mosley who suffered that and that your son then later commits suicide, as his did, and that your wife and the rest of your close relatives who didn't know this and you didn't want to know that, that the paper has been the moral arbiter that decided it should publish it. I think that's really grotesque. That's a huge intrusion into someone's privacy. He had a right not to have his private, secret life. I mean, people might disapprove of it. Many of my students, uh, my female students, go mad about the idea of a man hiring prostitutes. That is an that's an interesting question, but it still doesn't get to the heart of it, which is that some people like their lives to be private. When the, de when the Mail on Sunday exposed a well-known TV presenter for being a lesbian, she didn't want that to come out, which seems to me to be totally fair. That was her business. So uh, tabloids already decide that they are the ones who are going to have this kind of argument. When it comes to the Guardian supposed concentration on tittle-tattle. This tittle-tattle involved uh, world leaders who are elected people, some of them actually not elected, but simply have raised themselves up like Gaddafi, and these were interesting little gobbits of information that were there to illustrate how power corrupts. That seems to me very different from travelling down the lives of celebrities who are ni neither here nor there and just using them as, as sales fodder. Do I make my, am I being too equivocal? I, 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 the, 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 the point is, is the sort of power of celebrity. The point I was trying to make is the growth of the power of celebrity and the lack of belief um, that their, the tabloid media would be looked at um, by the broadsheet media with a certain amount of disdain. Um, and therefore the positioning of the broadsheet media could actually bring a very interesting perspective on those stories. Those things have merged into, in, in, into this sort of style of journalism. Uh, the day that uh, the, the Telegraph started running full page pictures of celebrities um, was, was quite interesting for me because you know, when my career started, to try and get a celebrity related story in a broadsheet, be the Times, the Guardian, Telegraph or whatever, you'd be laughed out of court. So there used to be a, a pro forma way of approaching um, an editor of a newspaper then, <coughs> just sort of writing to them first, and if they allowed you to speak to them, um, you would then respond. So what we the confidence um, and the investment needed to go into quality journalism has been lost. So therefore, we do not have what I call a strident, broadsheet journalistic mind now, because it's just not d deemed to be profitable enough when people are chasing readership. Um, and that's where the world, particularly in this country, has changed. So many of the tactics that were employed by some of the tabloids were, in fact, infected the way the broadsheets operated.
I do agree entirely with what Roy said, that people have a right to privacy on, on things like that. And frankly, I'd never heard of Max Mosley, and I couldn't care less. Absolutely. Right. Um, and, you know, neither have I heard of uh, the lady who let's refer to in this case as the Titanic, who apparently did go down on Ryan Giggs, who has now become a celebrity in her own right. Um, and it is this horrible sort of vicious circle that, you know, you end up doing a story, then the story becomes about how the press cover it. We know, all know about the super injunctions and all the rest of it. Mm. And it just becomes a, an absolutely hideous, uh, self-perpetuating, self-destructive animal, which has got nothing to do with news or public interest. But one of the things that has, you know, my background is, is broadcast rather than print. Broadcast journalism in this country is far more tightly regulated um, on the issue of public interest uh, than the, the press. And it seems to me that, you know, whether that's through BBC producer guidelines or whether it's through Ofcom or the internal machinations of, of whatever the particular broadcaster is, otherwise, you know, Sky News would be Fox News, and it's not. It's actually a very good, you know, balanced and, and, and sensible news organisation. But... If the broadcasters are controlled so much on what stands up to public interest as opposed to what interests the public, um, then perhaps that's where the lesson should come for the, for the print press, um, because in actual fact, you know, more people consume their media through broadcast outlets than they do through print. Um, so I just think that's you know, a point. Can I just ask, uh, when, when I was the editor of the Daily Mirror, uh, a story came to me suggesting that, because um, you work for Paddy Ashdown, I'm asking this, that Paddy Ashdown has had an affair with somebody. No. And I said, I said I'm, I'm not that interested. Yeah. And the political editor of the time, Alastair Campbell, said, I'm not interested either. Months later, that story appeared in The Sun as Paddy Pantsdown. That's right. Now, it was, was, was that, uh, was, and I felt I'd been responsible in turning it down. Okay, I, I decided I, at that moment I was an elitist and I decided I thought for the best possible reasons. There was, this did not affect him as a politician and never has affected him. So how did you as a publicist, well, acting for him anyway, feel about that story? Uh, Can I just ask you to be very brief because mm. then I want to yes. get Patrick um, to It made him, I mean, you know, it, it caused an awful lot of grief at home, but it actually did him the world of good. Um, because it, it, it propelled him. See, into, there, there lies. You know, it propelled there, there, him. There into lies. The, yeah. Pulitzer said, publicity, publicity, publicity yeah, exactly. is everything. And he's, you know, <laughs> he is to this day known as Pantsdown. Yeah, I, I'm not too sure how the, the, the gobbit about Nicholas Sarkozy chasing a rabbit around um, his office is actually a, a, an interesting example of how power corrupts. Uh, I, I mean, it just strikes me to be a bit of salacious kind of gossip and, and, and tittle-tattle. Uh, but, but uh, I mean, I think the th thing that makes me nervous about this is that people will use Max Mosley as an example, they'll use Millie Dowler's phone ha uh, hacking as an example, although, of course, as it's now come out, the, the, the journalist didn't actually delete the... Uh, you know, there's no... It's irrelevant. Uh, 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 well, it's irrelevant, but the Guardian used it 37 times and had to retract the fact that the, uh, the, the because the, the police at the didn't look, delete. Let's um, not let's not uh, the, let's the, not libel uh, let's messages. not libel Nick Roy, Davis here. Let's give please. Uh, Patrick a chance to speak. Well, 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 well it's, uh, it's, it's funny when you're talking about freedom of the press and you have a journalist accusing you of, uh, of, of libel and trying to restrict what, what you say about uh, situations, and which is unsurprising given uh, Roy's um, favouring of some kind of statutory backstop when it comes to regulating the press. I think, yes, it's sad that, for example, Mosley's uh, son committed suicide. It's, it's sad that um, it, it's sad that Millie Dowler's um, parents were caused a lot of grief by the, the, the phone hacking. And it's sad that people have had their private lives disrupted in this kind of way. What I don't think, that, uh, but we have to remember there are big things at stake here. That there is the, the fundamental issue of press freedom being uh, kind of uh, eroded if we go down this, um, this path which I think is such a keystone, a cornerstone of democracy. I think we actually do need to be quite thick-skinned about this and just say, yes, it's sad that these situations happen. There is a cultural problem. We need to have a debate about how we can actually tackle tabloid culture. But at the same time, if we start to say, well, the state can come in and decide for the public what's in the public interest, if we allow the state to start determining what can or cannot be said in the print media, we're in a very dangerous situation. Should the tabloid press have done better over the Jimmy Savile allegations while he was alive, um, or is there something different about that that's kind of not tittle-tattle? Um, why was it all too difficult? And secondly, do the, 
do the panel think that uh, part of the consequence of um, the present government setting up the Leveson inquiry has been um, a kind of revenge of the tabloids? Two points. First of all, um, a supply of tabloids will not create the demand of people to read them. So only if you had a lot of tabloids, that's not the problem. It's the people, if, if they want to read news like that, they'll go on the internet, they'll find other ways of reading it. So just tackling the fact, just uh, restricting the, the types of stories that are p um, <coughs> published in newspapers, I don't think that will help maybe um, different approaches like education or other cultural approaches, events, maybe that should be the approach to this tabloid culture. Mm -hmm. And also, I think there's a sort of a trade-off. People who decide to, uh, to go into acting or play, play football for the best clubs, they understand that with their huge salary comes also a sort of a trade-off uh, of privacy. The same thing with politicians. If you're going into politics, you understand that people will be interested in your private life as well. That's what, when you're choosing a career, whether you go into diplomacy, politics, or try to become a Hollywood actor or actress, you kind of understand that that comes with it. You, you could instead, instead just be a bartender or waitress, earn hundreds of times less money, but no one will be interested in your private life or which prostitutes you hire, what you do with them. So. <laughs> My point actually is just responding to your point, which is, I think we need to draw a very, very clear and distinct line between people who choose to make their life public, for instance, David Cameron, and people like J.K. Rowling, whose child was approached on the way home from school. No one writes a children's book to become famous. Should the tabloids have done better over Savile? Yes. Uh, why didn't they? Because they couldn't get the evidence that would satisfy their office lawyers uh, that they had enough evidence to actually publish. Uh, these were very young girls. They didn't come forward at the time, uh, and probably for all sorts of reasons, they were very vulnerable. Many of them were even disbelieved by their parents. So uh, there were these swirling rumours. Uh, I uh, worked in Manchester back in the 60s, and they were there then. Uh, I was a close friend of a high honcho at the BBC, um, who's now died, and she um, regularly referred to these things, but there was never any proof. when. Uh, the, when this story broke, the editor of the Sunday Express said he'd known for 45 years because Savile was put off a cruise ship at one point. He tried to publish that. He couldn't do so. Similarly, the editor of the Sunday Mirror back in the 1990s, um, uh, Paul Conyu, uh, uh, was also in the same position. He actually had two women come forward to him, but one of the, neither of the women wished to be identified, and the office lawyer said uh, that it's too bad. So we might reasonably, I say, blame our libel laws for that. <coughs> Although, as soon as I say that, of course, if you didn't have any libel laws at all, uh, people's reputations would be completely shredded on inaccurate evidence. But I think we all feel a bit of guilt about Savile. Um, I'm just going to take up uh, the, the trade-off argument, the, what, what we call the penalty of fame argument, by the way. The penalty of fame is that if you're famous, then part of your privacy you have to give up. And it's really difficult to know where the dividing line should be. Uh, my, my daughter's a movie actress, so I, you know, I, I've been at this at a personal level. It's, it's really difficult to decide how much of your private life you can keep secret and so on. So um, I, I do understand that. I once told Cherie Blair there was a penalty for fame. I think she walked out of the room when I said that and we haven't spoken since. But there is. I absolutely agree. Some of you do have to, at some stage, agree that some of your private life will be open. But it doesn't mean all of your private life should be open. Uh, and I think that we have to find a sensible round that. I don't personally don't understand why we have to know about footballers' sex lives. But, you know, that's, I suppose, just because fame... Uh, when I was a West Ham supporter, as I am still, uh, in my youth, um, I know that the members of the team back there in the 60s, the great team, were heavy drinkers, uh, and at least one of them, very, very famous, was a heavy womanizer. Nothing appeared in the papers in those days, um, and I, I think we all got on with our lives, and it was absolutely terrific, uh, and I wish that that was still the situation today. Um, that, that, as for politicians, they're different. They're elected people. And therefore, their private lives are that much more open, I think, to scrutiny. Um, it's, it's interesting about Savile. I think that Savile, what, you know, I think clearly, Roy is right, libel laws didn't allow him to be so. I don't think there was an appetite. I think people possibly knew 
he was deified as some sort of celebrity charity raising God. And I've seen it on numerous occasions. People who have that collateral and have those contacts are not pursued. And I, th I think that still possibly exists now. It's, it, it's easier to hide now. I think that um, fame is toxic. And I'm the first person to say that. And on the basis of those people who have pursued tabloid fame, perhaps in the last 10 years, um, have pursued it in such a way that they, it, it, it staggers me that these people then crawl, crawl foul when they have tipped everybody up. I mean, the type of people I've represented and been involved with have been professionals. And they recognise that there is a duty to their fans and to the process um, but they're not running around being photographed running out of the ivy. They're not selling their stories, their, um, you know, their, their beach holidays in Barbados to a tabloid news agency then to filter. Um, and those sort of people who you know, are professional about the way they go about their fame and their career do deserve to be treated accordingly as opposed to those tabloid fame seekers who will do anything to be famous to keep that 15 minutes or I call it eight 15 months of fame in, 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 in going. And the, yes, I think po po politicians and particularly footballers who purport to be one thing and are not what they are, do that hypocrisy does deserve to be exposed. And I think some of the scenes that we saw at the Leeds and Sheffield Wednesday um, game the other day that all are despicable scenes of violence go from uh, a culture where certain, uh, certain footballers are held by their sponsors and their money and would not think of any of the old Corinthian spirit. Very few footballers take on the responsibilities, their influence of younger people. And I, and I think that there isn't, there isn't a responsibility. If you talk about fame and you talk about tabloid age in the 50s, they're what, they're, they're, people did take very seriously their audiences and what they did. And I'm afraid that's gone. Well, just briefly on the Jimmy Savile thing. When he died, I wrote uh, on a blog um, that personally I'd always found him terribly creepy and couldn't bear that Sunday afternoon programme. For those of you who are as old as me, probably remember that speakeasy thing. Um, and I was absolutely inundated by hate mail and, and uh, stuff from people saying, oh, what have you ever done for charity? Well, actually, what's that got to do with anything? Because it does seem to me that, you know, we're talking about a Faustian pact to a certain extent. There's also the one that, oh, if you do something for charity, it's fine. Now, I'm not saying for a minute that Lance Armstrong is in the same bracket as, as Jimmy Savile, but he seemed to have got away with an awful lot because he's a cancer survivor and did a lot of stuff for charity. In fact, it seems like he, not only was he a cheat, he was a terrible bully. And, you know, on this thing about, as Roy rightly says, getting evidence, particularly then, is difficult. It is sadly always the case, or very often the case, that victims are rarely listened to. And there is one person who actually, I think, comes out of this whole Jimmy Savile thing, probably more badly than Jimmy Savile, is Esther Ransom, who knew about it. She was not a lowly thing at the BBC. She was actually in the middle of a relationship with a senior manager who then went on to become her husband, Desmond Wilcox. You know, and then she spent the rest of her life, presumably, trying to assuage her guilt for doing nothing. Um, by setting up child life. That's my personal view, and it might be unkind, but there you go. I do think, you know, this thing about, you know, who cares? Who cares about the West Ham shaggers of, of yesteryear? Who cares about Max Mosley? Who cares about half the people who appear on The X Factor on a Saturday night and apparently, you know, shot to fame and stardom the next week and vanished within a month? It would be great, and an awful lot of us do actually go, I don't care, I don't know who they are, and I'm never going to. But again, it comes back to this sort of media management thing. But I think you can't blame the press for everything. You also have to look at the continual um, infantilization that has gone on over the last 15, 20 years. And a lot of that, as Patrick alluded to earlier, has come from the government and the last government in particular. This idea that, you know, if you were a bloke you were very likely to be a rapist. You know, if you were, uh, so, you know, you've got all this sort of nonsense about, oh, you can check out somebody's record, uh, CRB checks and stuff like that, complete waste of time. <coughs> They're only valuable if somebody's been convicted. If Jimmy Savile was here today because he had no convictions, nothing would show on CRB. You know, so there's all of that sort of stuff. We're going to put all of these controls in place and we're going to get you to shop a benefit cheat and all of those things. So we've become infantilised. 
So we actually, as the reading or consuming public, have got as much uh, ability to change things by going, I don't know who these people are, I'm not interested, so I'm not going to read it. I mean, following off on that, actually, I mean, I'm very struck that quite a few people in the, the, well, the liberal media and the political class in general um, so seem to be very concerned, have sleepless nights about the fact that celebrities are having their privacy intruded upon. But when, for example, David Cameron talks about the fact that he's going to really start to get into the homes of 20,000 what he calls uh, troubled families and really start to monitor their private life, when you see the continual uh, rise of surveillance in public life uh, and, uh, you know, the erosion of any sense that a man's or a, a woman's home is their castle, uh, I, I, it's, uh, you start to think, well, actually, is privacy just a preserve for the rich now? Is it just a preserve for people, uh, you know, the, 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 for, for celebrities? And for the rest of us, it's fine for the, uh, for the state to increasingly pry and erode that private sphere that, you know, we used to hold very uh, sacrosanct. So, so uh, I, I think there are some serious double standards uh, there, which, uh, I mean, it's also reflected by the rise of the, the super injunction, which, which, was, which was mentioned. I mean, um, it worries me when you can take out a super injunction so the press ca cannot report about uh, uh, particular issues. It's a very expensive process. Uh, again, it's the preserve of the rich to do that. And people will joke about it. For example, Robbie Williams at a concert last year um, joked, who wants to be my super injunction tonight? Um, and with lots of kind of fawning girls screaming, saying, yes, pick me, pick me. Uh, and the idea is that he could have these affairs with these girls and just take out a super injunction and prevent the, the, the press fr from reporting on it. The J.K. Rowling situation uh, is an interesting one, but you have to just raise the question, well, what, what could be done about it? Do you allow the state to, uh, to have ever-increasing powers on what can or cannot be said in the media? Do you, allow the, uh, do you allow judges, unelected judges, to make decisions on behalf of the public about what's in their interest to read? And I think we need to really raise these questions because, yes, you can, uh, really, you can highlight some very harrowing examples of people who have been stigmatised and bullied by the media, libelled by the, the media. But what's the solution? What's the alternative other than to try and question and challenge uh, the, this culture, of, of uh, this tabloid culture in the public arena? If you start to legislate, you could do some very serious damage to one of the most fundamental aspects of our democracy. I'm quite interested that Roy Greenstone mentioned libel law because I've become a bit of an expert on libel because I'm in the middle of being sued by one of the, one of the country's richest men at the moment. And the two things that have come up in my researches on that is that, first of all, uh, who, who's likely to win and lose in the case of libel law it doesn't really depend on the rights and wrongs of the matter. And the origin of spiked itself, I think, illustrates, illustrates that. Uh, it, it leads to the second point, which is that libel is really only the preserve of the very rich. Uh, if somebody insults me, somebody calls me, um, somebody insults my, uh, my honour, I ring them up and say, that was a bit rum, um, can I buy you a pint and we'll talk about it and forget about it and they'll apologise. I couldn't possibly conceive of taking libel action, but the rich can do that. And I feel much the same about this concept of trying to build up um, uh, preserving the right of privacy, which is that depending on exactly how we do it, it will be yet something else that the rich can use to protect themselves against the rest of us, the great unwatched, but we'll have no protection ourselves. That's exactly the way the libel law works and exactly the way I fear that any uh, greater march towards privacy could work. Yeah, it seems to me um, that there are two separate issues you should consider here. One is whether tabloid newspapers, uh, like anyone or anyone else, should be allowed to steal, private, steal information. It seems to me that's a pretty straightforward matter. It's a criminal offence. It's theft. The other is whether celebrities should be allowed to tell newspapers what they can print about them and what they can't. Roy Greenstone seems to have swallowed the Hugh Grant line, hook, line and sinker here. And frankly, I find it astonishing that a former national newspaper editor and a tabloid editor at that um, should have fallen for such an old trick. Forgive me if that's libelous. Yeah, I just wonder what the panel think about the Kate Middleton uh, scenario, uh, whether that was a change, the fact that nobody really published uh, the photos. But also, more interestingly for me, what perhaps Mark or Joe as advisors to somebody in that position may have advised Kate, whether, they should have, whether she should have just turned around and said how pathetic and ignored it, or whether by creating an injunction or whatever, it drew much more attention to it, something that was going to be visible everywhere anyway. Isn't the Hillsborough case a good example of exactly why we don't want more state intervention or state regulation? 
you know, after all, the Sun listened to the police and government story. That was their story. The political demonisation of football fans led to that. The other thing on the Savile case, which has turned it, I think, is as uh, Spike have, have argued, into this sort of Salem style witch hunting, you know, paranoia about paedophiles um, <clears throat> over a dead person. There's something else going on here which seems to be lost with all this great heartfelt, you know, <coughs> self annihilation at the BBC in particular, which is that somehow all these hundreds of so called victims were all these, you know, hopeless, helpless women and girls, when in truth, you know, I don't really believe that was the case. There was plenty of women and girls, and I know myself those, because I was in Leeds, that I said, don't be stupid, don't go to his house, he's a dirty old man. Girls who were quite prepared to tell him where to go, 14, 15, or, you know, in their 20s, just as there were older women in the club in Leeds where he had a shagging room, who were able to have a laugh about it. You know, hundreds of women were not all hopeless, helpless victims, suddenly discovered after he's dead that they were too terrified to say. There were more important things in their lives and he wasn't the only dirty old man around. And being able to stand up to them without the BBC going into, you know, self-annihilation, I would think is a more important way forward than finding evil men floating about. A bit of toughness on the female part rather than victimhood, I would say it's a more positive direction. Um, you accuse the tabloids of denigrating culture and society and it's made us all less respectful of establishment, politicians, entertainers. But don't you think Andrew Mitchell, for example, without the tabloids, it wouldn't have been the Andrew Mitchell story? You know, why, should we, you know, why should we respect a politician who goes around calling policemen plebs or a politician who fiddles his expenses? Surely the broadsheets have been letting the uh, politicians and the establishment and the celebrities get away for it, with it for too long. I mean, yes, uh, there, there was a reluctance in the British media to publish the Kate Middleton pictures, perhaps rightly, although I do think there, there was a certain, um, a, a certain sense uh, among, among the media that there was a, uh, an attempt to take a kind of holier-than-now approach to the rest of the, kind of the, the, the foreign media by not publishing those, um, those photos. And there, there was a bit of grandstanding and trying to send a message to Leveson that we don't just... Uh, we, we don't just publish any of this kind of sleazy stuff. Um, the Prince Harry photos, I think, was actually more interesting because I think there actually was more of a public interest um, uh, case for those uh, photos to be published. And the Sun's, you know, waiting for two days before it actually did uh, run those photos, I think actually really spoke to a culture of conformism and nervousness that Leveson has generated. Uh, and I, I think even if there isn't statu a statutory backstop, uh, backstop, and, you know, I think David Cameron certainly is although he initially said that he would implement Leveson pretty much in its entirety if he thought it would be reasonable, it does look like there might not be that kind of statutory backstop to uh, um, it implemented. But I think there has a, cult a, a culture of conformism, a, a culture of you can't say that has been generated in the, in the wake of uh, Leveson, and it's already having massive Im implications for what the press reports. Um, so, so I think it's important to just uh, kind of stress that it's not just about um, you know, uh, legislation in terms of what could restrict uh, uh, press freedom, but also it's a case of a kind of journalist self-regulating, reining themselves in, deciding not to explore various angles that they would have done before. Just finally, I just wanted to bring up WikiLeaks because I do think that that is quite uh, important because it does speak, again, to how this is not just about the tabloid culture. There is a, a broader culture of voyeurism, a culture of transparency where the private um, sphere has been eroded. And I think, you know, a lot in the, uh, the Guardian, uh, uh, other li liberal media outlets really celebrated the fact that this stolen information, um, you know, which was lifted from web uh, websites or uh, was, was, uh, was, was obtained illegally, was published on, on WikiLeaks, um, you know, uh, it actually speaks to kind of a, a degrading of the journalistic practice as well. Uh, it's not just the tabloids that are hacking phones and uh, taking a kind of voyeuristic approach uh, to, to, to celebrities. It's also the, uh, the, the liberal mainstream media, which are now just trawling through data and trying to find stories there, rather than actively going out and trying to investigate stories, waiting for it to be handed to people, you know, in, in a disc or kind of put uh, in, in a brown paper envelope. Stealing stuff and investigative journalism and 
the death and dearth of proper journalism, I think, is at the heart of a lot of this. Um, and I think, as Patrick says, I think WikiLeaks, yeah, great, lovely, fantastic, loads and loads of information. You can trawl through it and you can find Sarkozy was chasing a rabbit before he was chasing Carla Bruni. Or was he going to cook it? Would have been a better story. Um, but, you know, whatever, it's a story that then it, came, it became its own story. And Julius and Assange, for God's sake, is now costing us an absolute fortune to keep um, sitting in the Ecuadorian embassy or wherever he is. Um, I think the Andrew Mitchell thing is a, is a different story. I would just raise the question, hmm, funny that the Sun got hold of the police report allegedly, um, on that, you know, and we're going back to the very thing that Leveson is investigating, which is about the closeness between the police and certain newspapers and to what Kerry said about Hillsborough, uh, and, you know, this is our story and, and all the rest of it. But I really, really, really worry that this becomes an issue about bad taste. And as I said at the beginning, if we start prosecuting people for stuff that offends, when there are plenty of laws against, you know, racial hatred, homophobia, and, and all of those things quite rightly. Let's not go down the route that we all have to think and speak like The Guardian. I, I, I've, I've started and talked originally about um, understanding um, the, the power of tabloid in, in its sense of its historical context. You know, the Penny Dreadfuls, which was the tabloid literature of the time in the 1890s, printed um, uh, an etching of life on the moon. And obviously it was erroneous and um, a... a Another publication obviously clearly defined how uh, this uh, this picture was in fact false. Uh, they sold twenty thousand of these um, of these penny dreadfuls um, with this picture of life on the moon. Um, when it was declared that it was um, that it was a fake, um, the same they had to reprint a further forty thousand <laughs> to be bought. So I think we're, we're missing you were missing one point. The point of the point that I claim for. Great PR is about great journalism and it's about the strength of dealing with great journalists. And I think the erosion of those values um, for easy wins um, is at the heart of the matter. Strong tabloid journalism it should be uh, marked by very strong broadsheet uh, commentary and journalism. And where broadsheet journalism is weak and uh, pays homage um, to the tabloid force, I think that's a bad place for us all. Um, Telegraph did a great service as well by obviously taking on board uh, the MPs' expenses. Uh, I think other broadsheet uh, newspapers uh, moved away from that. And I think that uh, if we're going to get some semblance of truth, if we're going to take on, and whoever said about uh, the, the power of, uh, of, of legal muscle now, it's true. Um, you know, justice is in the hands of those who can afford uh, powerful journalism, uh, powerful, um, sorry, uh, legal representation. And I think that uh, the world is a very complicated place. Uh, the web is incredibly powerful in terms of sort of spreading myth and conjecture. And I think uh, until someone finds a way to invest in great journalism, um, I think the ideas that we've exchanged here um, start a, a slow, um, you know, uh, a, a slow erosion of sort of values of, of, of us all. Um, uh, the speaker who spoke about the libel law, I mean, I agree with him, of course. Um, it's hard, hard to disagree with you. We, which is, I don't think the reforms will make enough difference, by the way. And uh, it's always, the law is always a rich man's game. We know that. Um, I just want to deal with, uh, with hypocrisy, really. Um, uh, the Cape Middleton, uh, all, the, all the papers uh, bowed down. Aren't we, aren't we lovely for having left Kate out of the paper? Uh, and wanted praise for having done so. Um, I think that would have happened before Leveson, by the way. There's plenty of, uh, of these kind of secret agreements, background agreements, bargains done between the palace and, uh, and Fleet Street. Um, and that, that would, have, would have happened at any time. Although I think you're right about Harry, that maybe Leveson played a part in the decision to delay that by the sun. But um, really... If you look at all these stories involving Princess Diana, involving celebrities, and you go into the street and you ask people ab about those things, they'll say, why don't you leave, it's particularly true of Diana, why don't you leave her alone? And every time you put her on the front page and you put her on the magazine, thousands of extra copies, the point that uh, Mark just made. In other words, there's huge public hypocrisy here. They pretend that they... Um, that they are sympathetic to these people, but at the same time they can't help themselves peeping. But the hypocrisy from the other side 
is that Rupert Murdoch and the other owners will tell you that they're publishing all of this out of public interest, when we know really it's commercial interest. That, so at, in every, on every side of this argument, which is why it's so difficult to get to the heart of the matter, there is gross hypocrisy, which is a huge problem to overcome. Um, uh, by the way, uh, two small things I just want to say. <coughs> On Andrew Mitchell, if a broadsheet had got that story, they would have published it. I mean, okay, the stories go around and come around, and I'm glad The Sun published it, um, uh, although Mr. Mitchell probably isn't, but it, it could, it, you know, the, the Guardian have got to break stories, the Telegraph breaks stories all the time. They've broken some interesting stories about the BBC recently, so, I, you know, it just, that just is, is the case, that some papers will break stories at other times. The, the second thing is the gentleman who, who told me he was upset that as a former editor I should decide that I should accept that celebrities should decide what's published about them. Uh, the truth is, it is a really grey area on deciding where their privacy should start and, and, and where, what should be public. In the end, I think one of the deciding factors is about methodology. If you use really unfair, underhand methods in order to obtain the information that's of no particular public interest value, then in fact I think you should be damned for it. But, I'm, I'm literally going to finish on this moment, if, if I was asked, would you or would you not hack, I would say, given the right set of circumstances, I would hack, I would ask a reporter to hack, I would ask a reporter to break the law, and I would break the law if the circumstances were correct, and then throw myself to the jury and say, you decide whether I did the right thing or not, because I think that would be the only fair thing. If I discovered that uh, a minister of the Crown was engaged in dealing in armaments, and I prima face the evidence for it, and the only way I could s sort it out would be hacking, go ahead and hack. It's not that hacking was wrong, not that breaking the law is wrong, it's the reason for doing it that really counts. Thank you.